Shalom, and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. I am blessed and honored to be uh, called upon to bring forth uh, the word this evening. And uh, as always, I like to uh, zero in on encouraging topics to breathe encouragement uh, into all of our lives, especially during these particular trying times. And uh, I'm going to be bringing um, a teaching rooted in covenant, and in particular, the aspect of covenant that uh, portrays for us God's love and acceptance in our lives. But first, we're going to pray. I'm, I have uh, chosen from the Torah uh, our text, and it, it will be Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 11. So let's pray. Baruch et Adonai hamvorach, Baruch Adonai hamvorach li'olam vo'ed, Baruch ato Adonai Eloheinu melech olam, Asher bachar banu mikol ha'amim, V'natan lanu et tarato, Baruch ato Adonai, Noten ha'torah, Amen. From Devarim 7, 6 through 11. An encouraging word. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of, of slavery, from the power, power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord is your God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. Then it goes on to say, Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws which I give you today. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam Asher natan lanu Torah emet Vechaye olam nata pituchenu Baruch atah Adonai Noten ha-Torah Amen Yeshua stated in his great high priestly prayer as recorded in Yohanan 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Yeshua, the Messiah, whom you have sent. To begin with, let's state the obvious. Sometimes the obvious, most of the time, the obvious does need to be stated. Knowing who God is, is ultra important. And you say to yourself, obviously. Let's examine the prayer of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, which is outlined in Nehemiah 1, verses 4 to 9. I'm not going to read through the whole thing. I'm going to rather focus on verses 5 and 6. 4 through 9 contains a very dynamic, powerful prayer. But... We'll begin at five. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to see and hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. We need to pay, again, special attention to verse 5, which I'll read again. And we'll keep this in mind. Let's keep this in mind all throughout the course of my teaching. Then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. How many of you, and I suspect not very many of you, are familiar with the Bedouin 
custom of betrothal? Probably nobody. So let me explain it to you because it is as follows. And it uh, emphasizes a certain point that I want to make. A girl is sold at a very young age and then a flag is flown over the house to signify it. And then a woman, usually another wife, inspects the merchandise. There's the transaction of a purchase, exchange of a dowry, but the poor girl never knows who her husband is or will be, will be or is, what he does, how old he is, and usually he's quite old, uh, until after the wedding night in a very dark tent. Can it be that all too often we are like this with God? And what is, you're thinking to yourself, what is this guy saying? Well, what do I mean? Well, we can make a commitment to him, yet we never really come to truly know him. We never come to know his character, his personality, his temperament, developing a friendship like Moses had with God. So the point is that God desires for us to really, really know him. Let's go to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. And it is written, My people perish for lack of knowledge. So, just how do we gain access, insight, knowledge into the ways that God chooses to reveal himself to reveal himself so that we may indeed know him. Well, to know him is to know his love. And we know his love through covenant, through scripture, through prayer, through meditation, through spending time with him. There are really, uh, I'm able to, to discern, you know, perhaps five separate discrete areas, five ways, if you will. One is we can see what is revealed in creation when he made the universe and he created life and he did such marvelous things. Or, secondly, there's covenant, which we're going to focus on. We can know him through Torah. We can know him through the prophets. We can know him through the words of, and teachings of Messiah. Well, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to choose covenant of one of the, these disparate topics. The covenant indeed reveals God's love for us. You know, if we look at our text, uh, we'll especially focus on Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 through 9, and I'll read that again. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. You know, you go back to the, the you know, slavery of our people in Egypt. What was Egypt then? Egypt was the most powerful nation uh, known to man at the time, with uh, militarily, scientifically, economically, agriculturally, in every way, they were the most powerful nation. And here's this group of people, you know, that uh, in the midst of a land filled with foreign gods, gods of this, gods of that, uh, led by Pharaoh as, as the reigning god, our god brought them out, brought them out 
via judgments on all the gods of Egypt. And afterwards, Egypt was a broken nation. Its army destroyed, its its agriculture uh, destroyed, uh, everything ruined. It was a desolate country at the time, all by the power of God bringing judgment on the false gods of Egypt. And it was because of his covenant. The broad definition of covenant in the Hebrew is berit, which literally means to cut. And it's actually derived from an ancient word which means to shackle or to fetter, to be part of, to be attached to, if you will. And the word covenant is mentioned over 350 times in all of Scripture. And it's an absolute necessary concept when we are seeking to know who God really is. In Scripture, covenant can mean one of two things. There's two different types of, of definitions of a covenant. There's One is a, 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 a bilateral covenant and the other is a unilateral covenant. A, 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 unil, a bilateral covenant is between two parties and it is a legally binding contract between two, uh, two participants. But a unilateral covenant is a testament, is in last will and testament. You testify to something. It reveals something. So we'll look at both. The contractual agreement is detailed in 1 Kings 5, 6 through 11. And to summarize this, in this account, Solomon, newly anointed king of Israel, makes a covenant with King Hiram, of Tayir in order to purchase cedars from Lebanon to build the temple in Jerusalem. Essentially, this contract, bilateral covenant, was a business transaction, a business contract, and is best understood as a binding business agreement between two parties, which is simply based upon performance. It says, when Hiram heard Solomon's message, he was greatly pleased and said, Praise be to the Lord today, for he has given David a wise son to rule over this great nation. So Hiram sent word to Solomon, I have received the message you sent me and will do all you want in providing the cedars and pine logs. My men will haul them down from Lebanon to the sea and I will float them in rafts by sea to the place you specify. There I will separate them, and you can take them away. And you are to grant my wish by providing food for my royal household. So this kind of covenant is predicated on nothing more than mutual uh, service and mutual satisfaction. You do this, and I'll pay thus. This covenant neither requires nor expects love or any further commitment from either party once it is accomplished, completed, or transacted. So, an obvious, another obvious illustration, uh, which is from today, is the United Auto Workers, the UAW, and General Motors contractual agreements. They certainly do not include love in their contracts, just the opposite. We ask the question, is it possible that many believers treat their relationship with God in much the same manner? Can it be true? Well, the deal is, Lord, I'll attend services, I'll listen to the message, I'll sing songs with everyone else, I'll put in my monetary contribution, etc., etc., etc. And in return, God keeps me out of automobile accidents, makes sure none of my checks bounce, puts food on my table, puts clothes on my back, and a roof over my head. But a very significant question looms with this. 
how many of us from time to time slip into this mindset or into this me mentality, if you will? We can say almost that this is a form of legalism and perhaps a business contract with God. But it's certainly not a better way. And God wants the better way. And this is what God hopes for and desires to enter into with us. The better way. So let's talk about the better way. On the other hand, you remember Fiddler on the Roof. A covenant can also mean a testament. You testify to something. A word is given. Well, let's look at Hebrews 9, 15 through 20. For this reason, Messiah is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to, provide, to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the, the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moshe had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people he said this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep here in this particular passage covenant is understood as a last will and testament verse 17 says it because a will is in force only when somebody has died it never takes effect while the one who made it is living by far the majority of testament or wills are based on relationships between people, which includes love, family, and friendships. And I'll talk about these three components of a unilateral covenant. And this is the kind of covenant God makes with man, a unilateral covenant. Remember the three aspects that I just mentioned, love, family, friendship. So the first aspect, which I mentioned, is love. John 3, 1 through 21, I think portrays this well. It portrays the account of Nicodemus, a leading Pharisee, coming to Yeshua in the dead of the night. And his heart, I believe, had been moved by his teachings, by his, by his examples, by his healing, um, in every way, by the Spirit of God. But he approaches Yeshua to meet with him and to speak with him in the dead of night. I think he did that because he didn't want anyone to see him coming to Yeshua, to sit at his feet and to ask him questions. And Yeshua challenged this man over and over again by saying, you are Israel's teacher and still you do not understand. What was he saying? He challenged Nicodemus so much that Nicodemus' uh, um, resistance melted away, as is Joseph of Arimathea. You see him with Yeshua in the end. John three fourteen through 17 says, So the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have or inherit eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but e e inherit or have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You know, the whole covenant concept was initiated because of God's love for man, his creation, the apex of his creation, and his compassion upon man also in his fallen uh, condition. We remember well the words of Yeshiyahu 
portrayed in Isaiah 53. Now the second aspect of, of covenant that I mentioned is that of family, very important, because it, it, it talks about the inheritance, which is the eternal abundant life. It's only given to members of the family, as in a will most of the time. John 1, 10 to 14 speaks to this very strongly. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his, it, his dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Emet and Chesed. So being born of God means that you are an important member of His family and therefore entitled to all the benefits therein. So, we have love, we have family, and next is the notion of friendship, which is, as I see it, the third aspect of a unilateral covenant or a testament. Let's look at Yochanan 15, 9-14. We can say the covenant is based on God's unconditional love for you in friendship with him. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is simply this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Then it goes on to say, this is my command, to love each other. So to some, we can say that the kind of covenant that God makes with man engenders love, engenders being part of a family, it engenders God's desire to have a friendship, a deep friendship with all of us. And these are the core or key ingredients of the recipe for life. It's God desires for us to embrace and to always hold on to, no matter what the weather is outside. So, With these three things, love, family, friendship, we need to know that we always remember that the covenant reveals God's provision for our needs. Abraham knew God as a covenant God. I think that we're all uh, aware of the testing of Abraham, which is portrayed for us in Genesis 22, 1 through 18. Um, It's a long read, you know, God tested Abraham, took his only begotten son to be sacrificed, and at the last second, uh, an angel of the Lord came and could see that Abraham was about to do it and told him not to do it. There have been many, many teachings on the Akedah, many, many aspects of it that are worthy of deep and lengthy analysis. 
So Abraham knew God is Adonai Yira, the Lord provides. And what did the Lord provide? The Lord provided the lamb for the sacrifice. But I think what's important, among other many important things with this particular passage, is to see what happened after the testing, which obviously Abraham passed with flying colors. You see, God was pleased with Abraham and expressed his pleasure to him. Contained in verses 15 through 18, which I'll read, of Genesis 22. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself. That's the essence of the unilateral covenant. Declares the Lord that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So we're here today because of the promise, because of the oath made by God that he swore on his own name, his own eternal everlasting name. What is God's name? If you're the only one in a room, do you need a name? (laughs) I always like to ask that question. But he swore by his own name which is everlasting, which is eternal, and which really is unknown to us, I believe. We have names for his temperaments and for his character and for his qualities. But does God really need a name? I don't know. Now on to Rabbi Saul of Tarsus. Rabbi Saul likewise knew God as Adonai Yira, the Lord provides. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11, encompasses the um, important principle of sowing and reaping as well as the provisional desires of God. We'll read part of this. Beginning at verse 6. Remember this whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Then it goes on to say, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So God is our provider. On a material note, on a physical note, and most importantly, on a, on a spiritual uh, realm. That is what he's referring to, I believe, here. Being rich in every way, full of joy, full of love, full of God's presence, so that it overflows in you and rolls on to other people who see this and are drawn to the reason why you are like this, because it reveals God. And Rev Shaul states, My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Messiah Yeshua. So the question is, and as a Yiddish mama, mamala would say, I have a question for you. How many of us today can testify to answer prayer, God meeting needs? I think all of us can raise our hands. God promises as a covenant-keeping God to provide for all our needs in every way, not necessarily our wants. 
And now next and lastly, the covenant reveals God as being faithful and trustworthy. Referencing 1 John 5, 13 to 15. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have that we know that we have what we asked of him. Bottom line is, God is not unreasonable, and he asks us to trust him, and for us, he sets out all his credentials, and all of scripture is a record of God's credentials. It's his resume. God has offered us a covenant of love, a covenant of acceptance, And he has promised and swears on his own name to keep that covenant true. So he has even made an oath over himself to confirm to us that we can trust the covenant that he has offered to us. And had it not been for our own sin going way back to the garden, our response to any statement of God's would have been much more simple and filled with faith. The death and renewal of life of Yeshua as God's beloved Son is the ultimate measure that God has undergone to guarantee His willingness to restore mankind to a trusting relationship with Himself. And I think and I believe and I feel that God is trying to rescue us out of our our distrust through a process whereby our souls become more and more reassured with each passing day, with each passing prayer, with each passing study. We are renewed, inspired to covenantal trust. It grows. It is through covenant that our souls emerge out of unbelief into intimacy with God as he desires it. Remember, God has gone to great lengths to restore us to a position where he can share his most intimate presence with us. Trustworthiness, then, is the purpose of covenant making and the big question looms. Will you trust God today? First Chronicles 16, 15, and I'll close with this, says, remember his covenant always, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations. You know, my, a very sobering thought, you know, is, is, part of scripture that where it says depart from me you who practice lawlessness I never knew you contrast that with the thief that was next to Yeshua on the tree who said I want to be with you please remember me when you enter your kingdom and Yeshua looked at him and said today you will be with me in paradise and we want to hear the words well done good and faithful servant enter into my presence. So with that, we'll say good night, and we'll say see you this Shabbat, or see you next Wednesday, or see you next Tuesday for prayer. So you got a few choices there. And Lord, thank you, Lord, for uh, your word that uh, reassures us, that strengthens us, that enables us to get through each and every day. And I pray for uh, everyone listening in now and in the future, Lord, that you would uh, work in their lives and that they would, would, uh, would sow generously and reap generously too. In Yeshua's name, amen.